Calvary friends and guests. What a week, what a week, what a week. I know we're all going through and experiencing a lot. A global pandemic, protests, a racial revolution. But may I encourage you, my brothers and sisters, to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, and yes, against spiritual wickedness in high places. But as the psalmist says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy, it comes in the morning. Welcome to Calvary Sunday morning worship service. Yeah. 
Good morning, and what a tremendous week it has been. All across the cities of America, cities have been destroyed, have been burned with fire in the response to the vicious, evil death of George Floyd. As pastor of Calvary Baptist Church, I take the stand of one which embraces a Christian family value system. Our Christian family value system says that there's a foundation that starts within the home. Observation, the lenses in which we see the world is through the Bible. Obligation is our responsibility to one another in the home. Maturation is our responsibility to grow as Christians. But the last one is motivation. And that's the value that I embrace during this time. Our motivation as Christians is to be a light shining against the backdrop of a dark world. And so our response should not be that of violence, but our response should be that of peace. I believe and embrace through the Christian family value system, the teaching of Jesus Christ. I embrace the reactions of Martin during the civil rights movement. Our Christian family value system, motivation, Romans 13 and one that we respond in a way that's Christian as we interact with civic civil society. And so I want to pray this morning that we as members of Calvary would remember to respond in peace. Responding in peace does not mean that we have to remain silent. Responding in peace does not mean that there is not a time when we have to engage civil, civil disobedience. But responding in peace means that we respond in a way that demonstrates that we are Christians more than name. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this week. And God, we pray for healing in our world. We pray for healing physically against COVID-19. We pray for spiritual healing. We pray for racial healing. Then God, we pray for revival within our churches, within our community, within the world. And then Father, we pray for your word to go forth with power, that it will convict, convince, and set free those who are captive. God, we ask that you would open up our hearts, our minds today, that we might be both receptive and responsive to what heaven is saying to the church during these perilous days. It's in the mighty name of Jesus Christ that we pray our soon coming King. Amen. And thank God.
Calvary Baptist Church. What a beautiful day to be alive. Any day is a good day. 
to be alive. It's the first Sunday, June 2020. It's the Lord's Day. It is Communion Sunday. And at the end of this worship experience, we'll, as a family, join in for the communion experience. I want to encourage you and your family to get your communion, your, your bread and juice or however you want to do it uh, that symbolizes the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We'll have prayer and we'll break bread together. Listen, I'm excited about this message and I've been challenged this week and by those who say they are Christian that we have to have a hallmark that identifies us as being Christians. And the hallmark of Christianity is love. Every now and then we need to calibrate our compass towards Calvary and have a refresher course on what love really is. I want you to grab your Bibles, your iPad, your phones, whatever you have. And I trust and pray that you will read with me together. Are we ready? Aim. Fire. This is my Bible. There are many like it, but this one is mine. It is my weapon. It is my roadmap in enemy country. In my Bible is found the plan of salvation. Romans 10 and 9 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It is by our humility towards our Christ, hospitality within our congregation, hard work within our community, that the unsaved would be one to Christ. Turn with me to the book of John, the 13th chapter, the gospel of John, the 13th chapter. And for your hearing, I want to read verses 34 and 35 of John chapter 13. The word of God reads on this wise. And a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this, all men know, by this shall all men know, that ye are my disciples, if you have love one to another. I want to read verse uh, 35 once again. I want to drop anchor in that verse. It says, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have love one to another. Amen, amen. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand. I like to place a tag on this text and use for a topic in which to preach with the aid of the Holy Spirit. Here it is. And they know we are Christians by our love. They will know we are Christians by our love. They will know we are Christians by our love. Here's the subtitle. Improve your serve. Peace. Jesus preached a message of love. And John makes it clear in chapter number 13, he embraces this picture of the loving Jesus and that Jesus loves us all the way unto the end. Watch how this text unfolds. It's a beautiful story of how Jesus interacts with those who he has led for three years, those who have watched him perform miracles, those who he has labored with, he has done ministry with, and he knows that even in the midst of the twelve, that one will betray him. It is his final hours. As a matter of fact, Jesus says, my hour has come. And no doubt he had to reflect in his mind three years ago when at a wedding of Canaan and Cana of Galilee, uh, the wedding couple ran out of wine and Jesus mother encourages him to turn water into wine. And Jesus said, my hour has not come. But now in this text, the hour has arrived. And on the next day, Jesus will be crucified on the hill of Calvary on the place called Golgotha, the place of the skull. His hour has arrived. Look at the setting. Is it not strange? Is it not a gloom setting? The impending gloom hovering over that room that night? That was a tense room that night. As a matter of fact, in the following chapters, Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. 
believe also in me. Jesus is encouraging his disciples and he's loving them all the way until the end. Look at what happens. Jesus is at a setting and he comes in to the room and he puts on an apron. He grabs a basket and he fills it with water. And he proceeds to wash his disciples' feet. The leader serving those who followed him. Servant leadership. And when he puts on this apron and begins to wash their feet, when he gets to Peter, Peter protests. And he says, I'm, I'm not having it, Lord. You're our leader. We'll wash your feet, but you, you're not washing my feet. And Jesus insisted that he wash Peter's feet, and Peter refused. But then Jesus says something to him. He says, Peter, if, if you don't let me wash your feet, you'll have no parts in the kingdom. Peter said, well, in that case, wash my hands, my feet. Give me a full body bath. And Jesus washes his feet, and he says, now you're clean. Watch this. But he says in verse 10, but not all of you are clean. Jesus knows that one of his disciples, those who had ministered with him for three years, those who saw the miracles, those who saw that he was able to do the miraculous, out of the 12, he knew that one would betray him. And he makes it clear that he's going to be betrayed that night. And when Peter asked who it was in John, the disciple in whom Jesus loved, Jesus said, the one who dips his hand after I give him the bread in the sock. And no doubt it was Judas. Verse 27 says, Satan enters into Judas and Judas runs out into the night, into the darkness. One commentator said what a sad affair it is to leave light and walk into the darkness and this is exactly what Judas does he goes out into the darkness as Judas was leaving Jesus says to Judas that which you have to do do it quickly get it over with that's a word to somebody that's listening to me on this Sunday morning that when people set traps in your life and you are aware, don't try to stop them. Let them do it quickly. Because as quick as they can do it, that's as quick as God can make your enemy your footstool. God can respond on your behalf. Now, I see three, three movements in this text. The first movement that I see in this text, watch this, is the dutiful Christian example. Jesus shows that position does not have any place in servitude. And even though you might be on top, even though you might be the chief, even though you might be the person in charge, he teaches the dutiful example of servant leadership. And he serves his disciples. I like this text. Not only does this text lift up the dutiful example, it lifts up, here it is, the dark betrayal exposed. Judas is exposed. As a matter of fact, when Judas dips his bread in the sop, he's exposed not only by his action, he's exposed by his ways, by his actions and his ways. He's Jesus exposes Judas. But not only is this text uh, emblematic of the dutiful Christian example, dark betrayal exposed, but third of all, the divine commandment expressed. Listen to the words that Jesus says, and, and this is the divine commandment expressed in verse number 34. He says, I give you a new commandment. Let the church say new. Come on, let the church say new. I give you a new commandment. He says that you love one another. Did you hear what I said? That you love one another as I have loved you. You have to love as Jesus has loved you, that you also love 
one another. I like this text and I'm preaching this because it's encouraging every believer, every child of God that you've got a job to do and that job is to improve your serve. You have to improve your serve. If you improve your serve, it is a demonstrative that love exemplifies a divine presence. What do you mean by that? When you improve your serve, you are showing that you have been occupied by divine presence. If God is in you, then you will show the love of God. Jesus Christ loves us and therefore he encourages us to love one another. When you improve your serve, then that means that love is exemplified by the divine presence that's in you. Come in 1 John. 1 John 3 and 14 says that, that we know that we have passed from darkness into light because we have love for the brethren. That we have love for the brethren. But then this text also says not only does love exemplifies a divine presence, but secondly, here it is, love exposes dark people. Ah, Jesus loved Judas all the way into the night. The last part of his life. One commentator says, the same son that, that hardens the clay also melts the ice. And it's an example of the love of God that he loved Judas just as he loved the other disciples. Even though he knew that Judas would, would expose him, he showered him with love until he just couldn't take it no more. That's a message for somebody that when someone does you wrong, love them like they never been loved before. I know that's a hard pill to swallow, but sometimes you got to shake it and take it. To live the life that Jesus has called for us to live, sometimes we have to, not sometimes, all the times, we have to love unlovable people. This text, it, it, it is an example of the divine presence within. It, it is, expresses, exposes dark people, but then love expresses the disciples' personality. That when you are a child of God, then love expresses who you are. Your personality is a personality of love. You, you can't treat people any type of way. You, you have to have compassion on the inside. When you recognize that you have been loved by God, when God has been merciful to you, when God has been kind and forgiving to you, then he expects you to return that favor to someone else. Listen, I discovered and learned at an elementary sense what love was at a young age. I had two parents that, that loved me. Oscar and Rosetta Moses, my brother, loved me. David, my family, loved me. I knew they loved me by their ways and their actions. My daddy, Oscar Moses, didn't play. And sometimes he would go in that closet and pull out that leather belt and apply his love to the seat of my understanding. It hurt me, but I thank God for it now because I knew that he loved me by his ways and his actions. I was a sophomore in high school and my sweetheart told me, she said, uh, OT, I love you. But two weeks later, she left me for my best friend that had a car. I knew that wasn't love. I knew that there was something that was different about that, but I knew it wasn't love by her ways and her action. In 1994, I met the love of my life. Jacqueline Marie Hawkins, now Jacqueline Marie Moses, and I knew that she loved me by her ways and her actions. It was Juneteenth, June 19, 2001, 2000. I'll never shall forget my late grandfather, uh, O.T. Moses, was laying dying in the Holy Cross Hospital on the south side of Chicago. And as he laid there, I whispered in his ear, I said, Pop, Granddaddy, I love you. And he looked at me and he said, I know you love me. 
by your ways and your action. Here it is, that love is more than just a proclamation. Love is a performance. We get our orthodoxy mixed up with our orthopraxy. Orthodoxy is what we say we believe, but orthodoxy is what we do. Preach, O.T. Moses. I'm doing the best I can, Lord. In other words, when you say that you are a Christian, it's more than just a proclamation. There is some production in your life. I'm preaching this because Martin Luther King Jr. said over 50 years ago that the most segregated day of the week is Sunday mornings. And that's the mornings that when Christians, black, white, red, yellow, all across the country, all across the globe, go to church. But yet, it's the most segregated hour of the week. How is it? That we profess our love as Christians, but don't show the love when a Christian is in trouble. Jesus encourages us to speak more than just dry words. That when you see people hurting by racial segregation, when you see the African American community in pain, because of unjust killings and abuse at the hands of those who are in authority, you can't sit back in your ivory tower and say, I'm a Christian, I hope things get better. No, you have to move from sympathy to empathy. Sympathy says, I feel sorry for you, but empathy says, I've got to feel your pain. I've got to get in this mess with you. I can't say I'm a Christian and see you suffering and hurting like this and just say, feel better. I contend that every now and then, you need to want to be in the world of the person that you say you love. If you can empathetically get in their world, then you'll help be a part of the solution to the problem. It was in the movie, The Green Mile, that John Coffey, he calls Tom Hanks over and he grabs his hand. And when he grabs his hand, Tom Hanks sees all of the evil that John Coffey sees. He feels all of the fear that John Coffey feels. He even feels the pain that John Coffey felt. And John Coffey responded by saying, this is what it's like every day. I had to give you a little piece of me. That's what the African-American community is saying to the broader community, that in your privilege, you need to come into our world to experience the pain. And if you can feel what we feel, then I'm quite sure that we could come together and do what needs to be done to keep this thing moving. I've got three points. I'm going to give them to you. Then I'm going to sit down and shout myself happy. And they know that we are Christians by our love improve your serve. How do I improve my serve? Glad you asked. I just love the way y'all ask questions. Well, if you're going to improve your serve, you've got to remember first the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. You can't say I can see your child your family being hurt and not do anything when on the other way around when it's you that's hurt you want help do unto others as you would want others to do unto you then there's another thing reflect before you react if you want to show the world that we are Christians by our love if we're going to improve our serve, then we have to reflect before we react. What do you mean by that? I simply mean that you have to reflect on the love that has been shown to you.
by Jesus Christ. I'm talking to Christians this morning. I'm talking to those black, white, red, brown that believe that the tomb in Jerusalem is empty, that believe that Jesus Christ died, that he was buried, and that he, was, that he rose with all power in his hands, and that he now sits at the right hand of the Father making intercession for the saints. I'm talking to you saying that we can't be Christians on the margin. We have to get in the center of this Christian struggle. Whether it's the black struggle, the Latino struggle, the, the Oriental struggle, it doesn't matter who's struggling. We can't do ministry from the margins. We have to do it from the center. And so therefore, I encourage you to reflect before you react because it was Jesus Christ that did not do ministry from the margins. He did it from the center. Romans 5 and 8. Let me give you a side order of scripture since I'm stirring over the gumbo. But God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners. That means yet, yet, yet means even before I was born, even before I came, when I was still over in the old country, in heaven, like my grandfather used to say, he died for our sins. He put his love on display. It was more than just a proclamation. It was a sacrifice of his life. You remember that Jesus Christ, you reflect that Jesus Christ gave his life for you. And when you think about what he's done for you, you can't get away with not thanking God for his grace. Grace augments and supplements our weakness. Grace steps in when we fall short. Grace is our strength in the middle of our, in, in, the, in the right very essence of our weakness. I'm talking to somebody who's looking back at me right now. You don't want to love nobody. You want to tear up stuff. You don't want to forgive nobody. What if God did not forgive you? What if God did not love you? God loves us just like we are beat up from the feet up, toe up from the flow up. Mouth is an open sepulchre, teeth set on edge, tongue full of poison. We're messed up, but we serve a God that is gracious. That's a good place to shout right there. Because when I think about the grace of God and all that he's done for me, I was about to run off. My soul says hallelujah. And I have to reflect that when people treat me terrible, I've got to love those who are unlovable. I've got to forgive people who are unforgivable. I told you, number one, remember the golden rule. Number two, reflect before you react. But then, number three, here it is, I'm going. Release what you have received. What do you mean by that? Release what you have received. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, we have received from heaven love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth shall not perish, but have an everlasting life. Well, I've taxied this run runway long enough. Runway clear. I see a direct flight towards Calvary. On that hill of Calvary was the best demonstration of love that we could ever, ever note in history, in our imagination, that Jesus Christ him, himself gave the sufficient sacrifice by dying on the cross of Calvary. Someone asked the question, how much does God love me? So much that his son stretched out his hands on the cross of Calvary died a tremendous death, was buried in a borrowed tomb. But three days later, he got up with all power in his hands. Isn't it good knowing that you are loved? A couple of years ago, as I was preparing this message, my mind, backstory, my mind went and reflect on one day I was in the library uh, asking the Lord to give me a message to preach on Sunday morning and, and, and thoughts were going through my head and I felt kind of out of sorts when I got a text. And I, I looked at the text and it was from my boo, my wife. And she said these words, guess what? You're loved. And I texted her back saying, guess what? You're loved too. And I had a flashback to 1978 
I was just an infant at that time. And, uh, uh, and I remembered the song that Teddy Pendergrass wrote. It's so good loving somebody and somebody loves you back. Not 60-40, not 70-30, but a 50-50 love. Isn't it good loving someone and knowing that someone loves you back? Despite of what background you came from, what side of the city you live on, what color of your skin, what social rung you're on up that ladder, knowing that as Christians, that the world would know that we are Christ-like by our love. Improve your serve. I don't want to take for granted that everyone is listening uh, that you have a relationship with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, or that if you die tonight, that you would be sure as to your eternal destination. As believers, we believe that um, because Jesus died, Christ died on the cross of Calvary for our sins, was buried and rose again, that he now sits on the right hand of the Father. We believe that. We believe that he lives, that he lives throughout eternity, and that secures our salvation. The Bible says, in Romans 10 and 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. At the end of this broadcast, there'll be a number connecting those who may not have a church in between church or not sure of your salvation. There'll be a number there that you can call directly. You can become a member of Calvary today. You can become uh, a part of our prayer Ban. You can be prayed for today. You can make a decision today for Christ. It is decision making time. And we'll have our decision time counselors waiting for your phone call. I know you're out there. You're not sure. Don't have a church home. You can call your own. You need to make that call. The doors of the church are wide open. Jesus left them that way. If you would like to become a part of this church, you can come by letter or a candidate for baptism based on the profession of your faith or for restoration. We have decision time counselors standing by to take your call at 801-355-1025. Again, 801-355-1025 between the hours of 1 and 3 p.m. today. And have a blessed and wonderful day. Amen.
I certainly pray that you were blessed by that message. They will know we are Christians by our love. Improve your serve. <laughs>
Finally, um, by the grace of God, my wife and I um, traveling back to Salt Lake City and we have moved all of our belongings out of our house. Um, this has been a week and I certainly thank all of you for your prayers as we travel now, my wife, my mother in love and myself to Salt Lake City to roll up our sleeves and get into ministry. We look forward to seeing each and every last one of you and sharing uh, the love of Christ. Uh, in the weeks to come, we will be um, giving you information how we will try to get back into the sanctuary. It might be with a few numbers here, a few numbers there, but the leadership team and those of you that have done surveys, so thank you so very much. And we will use that information to make sure that we have a safe worship experience at the Calvary Baptist Church. Listen, we are praying for uh, the Tate family in the home going of Mother Elizabeth Jackson. Uh, Tate family, just know that you are in our prayers and we thank God for the legacy, the love, and the memory. Although I was only at Calvary for such a short time before I met Mother Jackson, I never shall forget that Sunday morning uh, she sung her song and the spirit just came over her. What comes from the heart uh, reaches the heart. And I saw the Lord in her in such a mighty way on that day. I'll never shall forget. I told Deacon Tate when I saw him, your mama tore up this church <laughs> and you wasn't here. And he was working that morning. But we're praying for the Tate family and we're thanking God for the memory of Mother Elizabeth Jackson. Jackson. Listen, that's all I got. God bless you and God keep you is my prayer. Good afternoon, Calvary. It's time to celebrate our 2020 graduates. Please send your information to Christian Education at CalvarySLC.com. That's for all graduating seniors from high school and college, as well as those who are being promoted from different grades. Again, send your information to Christian Education at CalvarySLC.com. Congratulations, graduates. Good afternoon, Calvary. Deacon Johnson here. I hope you enjoyed the online services today and was blessed by the message. I want to take a brief moment to encourage those of you who have not yet taken the survey regarding Calvary's reopening to please be so kind to visit the Calvary website or the Calvary's uh, Facebook page to respond to the 10 survey questions regarding the reopening of Calvary. We want to ensure that all of our members are heard and the input are given as we plan to reopen the church. Thank you so much and be blessed. All right, now I think you got it. Come on, let's glory in the Lord.